the last video, we covered the beginning of a massive cherry hutch with arced doors. What we haven't covered is the turn legs, solid cherry drawers, and all of the extras like trim, finish, and glass. So what are we doing sitting around? Let's get to business. So we left the cabinet boxes off last with nearly finished face frames, but I think some curves on the bottom skirt would offer more of a furniture type of look rather than kitchen cabinetry. So before we go attaching the lower face frame to the base cabinet, it's easiest to use a template now rather than later to create that curve. Since the grain could tear out as I pass the center of the curve, I've noticed it's worth flipping the whole thing over and using a flush trim bit to route the other side since this will still be cutting downhill, and therefore with the grain. And if this doesn't make sense, that makes sense. Let me show you. Often when using routers, we encounter a problem called tear out. Let's use this concept to understand why the direction of the curve matters. Tear out most often occurs when the direction of our travel is against the grain of the wood rather than with the grain. So on the curve, we would start on the left and travel downhill and with the grain until we meet the center. But as we round the bend, we begin cutting uphill and against the grain. And this doesn't always end in tear out, but more often than not, you'll get this. <sighs> so leaving the template on and flipping the whole project over offers a way to use the flush trim bit and cut downhill. On the plywood sides of the cabinets, I don't have to worry about direction, but I do have to carve away the mounting blocks a bit because I made them way too wide. And now the frame can be mounted to the cabinet with the previously cut dados and pocket hole screws. And the curve on the frame can be cut into the cabinet itself. Once again, I'm cutting plywood so I don't have to worry about direction. The next step before we stand this cabinet upright is turning the legs. The glue up was finished in the previous video, so now we can cut it into an octagon. This will decrease the amount of time we spend on the lathe. I'm also cutting it into two shorter sections that will create two legs each. I just have a small bench top lathe for this and this will do just fine. Getting it into a round cylinder first will make it easier for me to transfer marks from my template. I have one printout from SketchUp that shows the final shape and measurements of specific diameters. The other template is a cross section of half of the final shape that I can use to mark the blank. To make the lines more understandable, I made it so that one line means an outer curve and two close lines mean an inner curve. Then I blacked out the sections that aren't a part of the legs at all. Now, I'm definitely not a lathe expert, and from time to time, you may see me even use a cheap chisel for the small spaces, which is a big no-no for the lathe enthusiasts. But hey, sometimes new cutting tools aren't in the budget, and you have to get by with what you have. I'm working on getting the inside curves to the right diameter and using a set of calipers to measure as I go. I continue shaping and checking, taking off little bits at a time, then run through the sanding grits, ending at 220. And in case that went way too fast, we still have two more legs, so here's a time lapse of my process. By finding the inside curves first, I can cut my outer curves to flow into the rest. Then I can stop and use my template to redraw any lines or check the shape, then continue. It's really not the hardest woodworking task, and it's nice to add a hand-turned component to a project once in a while. Before we get impatient and cut the legs apart, let's use the centers that are already marked from the lathe and drill large holes that will be used for threaded rod. Just make sure you drill deep enough so that when you cut the excess off, you don't also cut the holes off, which I thankfully didn't screw up. Then I can cut them all to length using a fence as a stop block to ensure they all come out consistent. I would taper the bottom if I were you, because this makes sure you don't get splinters when you move the cabinet around later. 
And by splinters, I mean on the actual leg itself, not necessarily your fingers. The way I'm choosing to mount them is using simple threaded rod. So with a groove cut in one end, I can use this as a tap to cut the threads into the wood. Just be soft with the drill so you don't strip out the hole. Then some medium super glue will add adhesion for the piece of threaded rod that I drive in. And there they are. I'd rather get the cabinet back onto the bench now so I can mount the legs easier as well as work on the drawers easier. And boy, I sure wish I had an employee. Now trust me, I'm as ready as you are to mount those dang legs, but we really have to add the final skirting first because the position of the legs is pretty dependent on the skirt. This is a very simple square profile with a 3 16 round over on the top edge. The miters are easy enough to cut on an accurate miter saw. Then the pieces can be dry fit to check the lengths. I mark the curves with a pencil and rough cut them wide of the line on the bandsaw. I like using a pin nailer to temporarily mount them because the pins leave very small holes. And unfortunately, I can't follow the advice I gave earlier about routing curves. On these, I'm forced to route against the grain with the way I'm choosing, so I just go very slow and use a very sharp router bit that I will link in the description, followed by a quick sanding. Now I can find positions for the legs, pre-drill a starting hole, and use a guide block to make sure I drill perpendicular to the surface. Then I just use the same tapping tool to cut some threads and screw the legs in, finally. The cabinet can be swept onto its feet. And by the way, I offset the back legs three quarters of an inch forward to leave room for baseboard against a wall. And voila. Next up is mounting the drawer slides, but I mean, come on. I show this almost every time and ugh, I know you're upset and you have every right to be, but sometimes we just have to move on. Wow. Sounds like that dude is going through a hard time right now. And that dude, me, I actually am. You may have noticed that I haven't posted on my usual schedule recently, and that has to do with my sobriety. Most of you probably don't know that I'm over three years sober from alcohol and over eight years sober from, sub from, substances, from substances like heroin. And this is my purpose. That is until life crushes my very soul and sends me into a deep and dark depression. Don't worry, it gets a lot better from here. Whether I like to admit it or not, I've never been all that good at managing how much energy I put into my relationships versus the energy I put into goals such as woodworking. I've always gravitated towards putting more effort into woodworking because it brings me more joy. That's just how my brain is hardwired. And don't get me wrong, I put a lot of energy into my relationships, but I could only last so long making them second priority. And with a new woodworking business, a new YouTube channel, and a new employee, the pressures were really starting to build for me. Honestly, I began feeling overwhelmed. So where does this sobriety thing come into play? Well, my sobriety is dependent on my state of mind, my mental health, but my mental health is dependent on my sobriety. And as pressure of large goals in my career started to build, so did unmanageable expectations in my relationship. So something had to give. And of course, what do you think imploded? It was unfortunately my relationship. And the reason I'm being vulnerable and sharing this with you is because I think it's important that you know I'm human, just like you. And I want nothing more than for you to gain something from each of my videos. My message here is, it's okay to fall short sometimes. We aren't always gonna make smart decisions and we certainly aren't perfect. So just know in the future, I will continue trying my best to make amazing content for you because it really is my passion. And if I'm running a little late on getting a video out, 
just know that it's for all of the right reasons. Now that the drawer boxes are done, we can mount the faces, which in this case I added shims to the back of the floating panels so that the drawer pulls stay on over time. If you leave the back area hollow, hardware can compress the floating panel and therefore never be tight. Then over time the hardware can come loose. These shims that I'm using are creating 3 16 spaces for clearance. Now some holes are drilled at the top for mounting the countertop and the top two drawers can be removed so we can access that area. The top is made of six quarter cherry and we glued up the panel in the last video. I'm grateful enough that I can send it through my planer, but obviously you probably can't. So sanding with an orbital will be just fine. My final thickness is an inch and a quarter. The two sides and front edge get a small round over, then the panel can be installed. I of course make sure to use screws that aren't too long. We don't want screws poking out of the brand new countertop. Now that the top is in place, we actually have a surface to set the upper hutch on. But there's one step that I want to finish first while the cabinet is on the ground. The crown molding will be sitting on a riser block, and it's much easier to attach this riser now rather than when the hutch is 8 feet in the air. Notice the layout line on the piece. This will tell me how far out to place the riser to create an overhang. Some brad nails tack them on, and some screws are a more permanent solution. I decide to cover the cherry top so I don't hurt it in the process of getting the hutch into place. Then it's fixed to the top using screws from below. Some thick baseboard and a cove molding are wrapped around the perimeter of the hutch to add some decoration. Cove molding also gets installed under the countertop, again to add character. You can see that I added a standoff so that the cove sits above and in front of the drawer face. While I'm thinking of it, I want to get some adjustable shelves made, but they need edge banding glued on. It's simple enough to cut them to size and add some strips of cherry to the front edges. Here's a pro tip. You can scrape off the excess glue with a drywall knife. Don't use a wet rag or your tape won't stick. And now those can sit and dry while we finish up the hutch. I want to take a second and truly thank my Patreon members. I am so thankful to have members that want to support the Fortress team. I even had a couple people direct message me on my Patreon page to check in because they really care. And that means more than you could ever imagine. If you haven't checked it out, I made three awesome tiers and you can become a member for as low as $3. And the first 20 patrons get a thank you gift which is handcrafted by me and just about finished. Moving on, the cabinet doors are installed like normal, although the glass won't be glued in until after finishing. And here's a small extra tip if you need to move the door up slightly. Loosen one hinge, push up or down depending on which direction you need to go, then retighten the screw. Do this to the next hinge if you see no change. And there you go, easy peasy micro adjustment. The crown molding is cut using clamps as crown stops. I always take my time on crown so that the joints are nothing short of perfect. Trust me, it's worth it. They are just tacked up for now with pin nails so I can disassemble everything soon. The holes can also be drilled for the hardware now. Notice the difference in darkness of these two cherry components. This counter is way too light in color, so I'm setting it in the sun to darken it for a day. Now everything can be finished using Sherwood Water White Conversion Varnish because it matches the current vanity the best. Now the glass can finally go in. 
I add very small beads of silicone to the inside edges of the rabbets. Then the glass can be carefully set into place, making sure the frosted side is towards the inside of the door. We want the shinier, more resistant side facing out. And the small molding can be cut and pinned in place for better showmanship. Remember to add the correct thickness of bumpers to your drawer faces and doors. For Blum hardware, I always use 3 16 thick bumpers. And after one final assembly, we are finally finished. Please subscribe if you enjoyed yourself. And remember, the closest to perfection we will ever come is accepting ourselves for who we are and being content with what we've accomplished. With that said, here's the final shots. You can subscribe by clicking on the left icon and here's another awesome video to watch.